you just saw all that. Uh, <laughs> but we are currently in the midst of a windstorm after the big snow blizzard here, and we keep going in and out of power. So that's also adding kind of a fun element to this menu. Uh, <laughs> there's gonna be all sorts of reasons why some of this turned out strange. Hi friends, and welcome back. We are now at week three of the 52 Sunday Dinners Project. Here is what we're having today. Today's menu includes a chicken pot pie, tea rolls, mashed potatoes, which we are skipping again this week because mashed potatoes are on just about every menu. We will be doing the mashed turnips. It also calls for cucumber pickles, which we are skipping and I will explain why when we try everything out. The salad portion is a fruit salad and strawberry gel, which is really just a combination of the two and it's a fruit jello salad. Then for dessert, we'll have cherry pie and as always, coffee. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. My name is Ashley and I'm a registered dietitian and I have a love for everything vintage and food. If you'd like to know a little bit more about what we're doing here in this whole 52 weeks of Sunday dinners, go ahead and refer back to week one where I give a little bit more of an explanation on kind of the mission and purpose of this whole project. Those of you that have been following along for the last, I don't know, close to between 20 and 25 dinners so far, there's about to be kind of a major change coming to this whole project. I've been looking for some answers to some medical questions for, well, we're going on fifth, between 15 and 20 years now that I've been seeing different specialists and doctors and no one's been able to give me an answer. Uh, I've been seeing a dietitian now for about a year and a half, and we're starting to get down into some niche testing and answers. Long story medium length, we've gotten at least one answer and there's still some more testing to do, but the first step in fixing some of the issues that I have going on is to cut out gluten, which is a little bit of a, a wrench thrown in here because just about every recipe has some sort of all-purpose flour, bread flour, cake flour. There's gluten in just about every one of these recipes. I have a plan for how to solve this and I think I'm gonna go about it three different ways depending on the week. And if you'd like to go ahead, join me in the kitchen, I'll explain a little bit more as we cook. I don't think that gluten-free flours were a big alternative in the 1920s. However, on weeks that I don't have anybody here available that is willing to be on camera and can also eat gluten to try some of these recipes, my plan is to either make the recipe with gluten-free flour, which is what we're doing this week with everything. We're gonna experiment, work with some things, and I know this isn't ideal for most of you, but I hope that some of you who have celiac disease or some other sort of reason that they can't have gluten, hopefully this is an outlet that maybe you haven't seen people do before. I know I've not really seen any historical cooking done with gluten-free flours before because historically I don't think it was available. And so hopefully for those of you that are in a situation similar to mine right now, maybe this is something that is nice for you to see or helpful for you to see. And if you wanna try and follow along with these recipes also, uh, you can see maybe what works, what doesn't work, what flowers work with different things, uh, which I'm sure you already know that because you've probably been doing it a lot longer than I have, but um, that's, that's the plan for that route. The other route that I would like to take is to, if I have somebody here who can eat gluten and is willing to be on camera, I'll just have them taste it. I'll make it as it was meant to be made. And like if Tori is here, I'll have her try it since she can eat it. And 
I'll be reaching out to a few friends and maybe some other people that I think would be willing to try things on camera and would be a good fit for you guys to meet and see if they'd be willing to give their opinion to things. The third option is if I have some people that I know that can eat the recipes with the gluten in it, but they're not willing to try it on camera, but they are willing to try it and give me verbal feedback or text feedback on what they thought of the recipes, then I will give the feedback to you via that way. So I'll just take what they said and let you know what they thought. I know a lot of that is, you know, seeing people's facial expressions, body language, that sort of thing is really important feedback, but we have to work with what we have here and that's what we have. I have a fourth solution as well, and I'll talk about that one a little bit more when we sit down to dinner. I have put spoons underneath of these because they aren't level, and I think the lobster here might be a little unlevel still, but at least it is sturdy, and I don't think it's, yeah, it's not going to fall over at least as we put it away to cool. Well, maybe we won't need that little lobster. I might just be eating the fruit salad out of that lobster. For this recipe, it calls for a sponge starter or a sponge bread, I believe. And I have heard of sponge candy. Watson's Chocolates in Buffalo and Niagara Falls makes a fabulous sponge candy, but a sponge bread, I'm not sure that I knew what that was or how to start it. So this is one I also did decide to look up online first. This week, I don't have somebody to try these recipes with me. And I think I just want to uh, try some things differently, I suppose. Try some with gluten-free flour, try some with regular flour. Those of you with celiac or other medical reasons to cut out gluten, maybe you'll appreciate this. Those of you that don't have to, I can understand your frustration if you are wanting me to follow these recipes precisely. Here's another one that I was uncertain about. I did look up what a bread sponge was. That way I could see what exactly I was doing so we didn't ruin it completely. And the one I went with was the, I guess the drier one because it doesn't say to add any additional flour or anything like that. And so I think it was more important that this be, I guess kind of more of a dry dough than a batter. And then I also looked up tea rolls and every tea roll recipe that I found didn't start with the sponge. And so I guess I'm just a little unsure how I'm supposed to mix these ingredients in. Should I cut them in with a pastry cutter? Should I mix them in with a spoon or my hands? Or maybe even knead them in? It doesn't talk about kneading, but should I be kneading this? I'm not sure. The shortening is throwing me off because I feel like I should just knead it with my hands, but that shortening seems like it should be cut in. Okay, this egg has made this exceptionally wet. There's no way this is right. And I'm again wondering, just like with the pie crust, is the flour a problem here? Is it not absorbing enough liquid or do we need just a little bit extra of it to make up for the lack of wheat flour? I don't know, but I, I'm not sure. Again, with changing the variable of the flour, I can't know if this is the intent, and I can't imagine that it is. And if it is not the intent, I can't know if it's the recipe that's a problem or if it's the flour that's a problem. And I know I'll get to know that eventually and learn a little bit more. But in the meantime, I'm gonna sift a little bit more flour over this. I know this can't be right, but we're gonna go with it and we're gonna see what happens when we try it this way. For this pie crust, we are again going to try it with gluten-free flour, which I know throws off the whole idea that I may improve my uh, pie crust skills because our friend Cindy has very lovingly not only sent me a recipe that she uses along with instructions and some troubleshooting with if I'm experiencing this 
issue maybe I need to do this to fix it. She also sent me a video showing step-by-step -step exactly how to fix my pie crust and what it should look like. And I was super excited because I knew I was gonna get it right this time with her help and with this practice. And now I'm not really sure if it'll turn out the same with the gluten-free flour, but we're gonna try it. And uh, I guess we'll just see kind of how it goes. I've measured out by grams all of the ingredients so that it takes at least one issue or one possible problem out of the equation here. And we're just gonna see using the recipe and method that Cindy sent if it will translate with this gluten-free flour. We're using the recipe with this flour. It is exceptionally sticky and I think I probably need a good bit more flour. Probably I should have remedied that prior to adding the water and I should have cut in some more flour. However, we're here now, I'm realizing it now, I'm gonna sprinkle a good bit more flour over the top, on the bottom, around the sides as we bring this together. I'm gonna try and work a little more flour in there while I guess working it as little as possible with my hands and hopefully it'll be just a little bit less sticky and more of the consistency that we want it to be. We're gonna separate it, put it in plastic wrap and let it rest. I'm gonna let it rest in the refrigerator for about 30 minutes or my intention is 30 minutes and then when I get back around to it and remember that I'm supposed to be working on the pie crust, uh, it'll be at least, we'll just say it'll be at least 30 minutes until then. out. We're going to dip it in warm water. Hopefully it will release from this mold 
and we will finally have a gelatin recipe that works. I think we need to soak it a little longer. Okay, we let it soak a few more seconds. Let's try it again. Three, two, one. Oh, I think we let it soak too long. Oh no. Okay, it's not the worst. Maybe soaking it two or three seconds less would have been better, but oh boy, it's time to try everything. And I'm sure some of you are really anxious to see how everything turned out this time. And I have to say, the chicken pie doesn't look too bad. I'm hoping that it tastes as good as it looks. The tea rolls, ugh, they kind of look like turkey or chicken meatballs. They definitely, let me show you those. They do not look like rolls and the texture definitely is very off. I did not I kept adding more and more and more and more flour to them and they never hit a consistency where I could have kneaded them and or rolled them out at all. I did more of like a drop biscuit kind of thing for them. And so I know that this is nowhere near what it should have been. And I, I know it has to do with the flour that I used, but I'm also wondering if as I said multiple times earlier, if it's something to do with the recipe as well. I don't really understand the use of the sponge first and then adding those other ingredients to it after. And maybe the sponge would have been different if I would have used regular all-purpose flour. Speaking of the way that some of these turned out, this leads me to my next kind of announcement for how to solve some of the issues that are now going to come up based on my medical <laughs> history and uh, necessity moving forward. I've been kicking around an idea for the last several weeks and this change in my diet I think has really solidified that I, I hope that it's a good idea. And that is that I'd, I'd like to start a Facebook group for the discussions to continue. The comment section is excellent and several of you have been emailing me back and forth. And so those conversations, we've been able to build on those and that's great. And I love that we now have a relationship through that discussion and comments, but I think it's really important that you guys are able to form your own discussions and relationships outside of me as well. You have a lot in common and you have a lot to talk about. And I think all of you would benefit from getting to know each other a little bit if you want to. And so I'm going to put a link in the description below for the Facebook group that I'm going to create. And I really encourage you guys, if you decide to follow along with some of these recipes, Show the pictures of them if you want to. Share how yours turned out. If you did something different with it, if you changed the recipe a little, tell us about it, show it to us. And uh, if you have memories that you wanna share and talk about based on some of your foods that you remember and things that you wish that maybe you would have known before but didn't get a chance to ask, ask it there. Maybe somebody there knows, but I think the whole point of fostering a community is great, but I think it's stunted here. And I think we could really expand that community presence and mindset and bonding and getting to know each other through a separate group. 
Now, if you think that's a terrible idea, that's perfectly fine. You don't have to join. You don't have to join the conversation or anything like that. You can just continue watching along if you like and uh, participate as much or as little as you want to. But I hope you continue to stay. And if you decide, I hope you continue the conversation outside of here. With that, let's get to trying this food because I am starving. <laughs> Check that out. It doesn't look too bad. Let's try a little bit of it. I want you to be able to see what it looks like cutting into it a little bit. Hmm. That looks like it might be a little underdone, although, you know, if you've been here very long, you know I kind of like mine underdone a little, although it, maybe not. Maybe it just is kind of a different texture like that. Let's go with the outside though, just in case. I also know that the recipe says mashed turnips next to the mashed potatoes. It says to slice them and cook them in very little water. At no point does the recipe say mash them, nor does it say to add milk or anything like that. And maybe it is implied that they should have been mashed afterward and mixed together, but I kind of like them sliced like this. And so I'm gonna leave them sliced but if you're following along and want to mash them at home, that's great. The chicken certainly could have used more gravy. It looks like the gravy kind of got swallowed up in there and it's not looking exceptionally dry, but it doesn't look nice and rich and thick with the gravy. So I think it, it could have stood for a little bit more, but let's, I think I wanna try the biscuit topping first with this grain-free flour. It doesn't smell any different than a regular biscuit to me. You know, as far as biscuits go, this might be slightly sweeter, maybe a, a tiny bit grainier, but overall, not a bad substitute. If I did not know that these were gluten-free, I don't think that I would be able to tell. I think I would just think this was a biscuit and move on and not put any other thought into it. So the recipe I used was actually from online and <laughs> as I normally do things, I didn't completely follow the recipe. And so if you really want to know more, email me, reach out to me, and I'll send you the link to the recipe that I used and uh, tell you maybe some of the few tweaks I did to this, but um, yeah, gluten-free biscuits, not too terrible with this flour. Let's try it with the chicken and the gravy. The chicken smells really nice. It smells like chicken and biscuits. And that tastes really good. It tastes very comforting. It's very, it's a nice, appropriate warm meal for right now. If you remember, my electricity has been going in and out this whole time. It is blowing like crazy. There are things blowing over all over the place around here. It's wet, mix of wet, snow, snow, rain, sleet kind of mix with hugely giant winds. It is not nice out there. It's really nice to have this comforting chicken pie. Now, these biscuits, tea biscuits, let's just see what happened. Kind of looks like a meatball on the inside too. It smells very, very yeasty. I think most people will find this unpleasant. I don't, but after you chew it for a moment or so, it starts to get almost slimy. It kind of tastes like I'm eating, doesn't taste. It feels like I'm eating okra without the snap of the outside. Whatever this flour mix is, it has something in it that is just a little bit 
slimy, I think, when hydrated. And I noticed that when I was mixing it and even washing my hands and feeling on my fingers, I thought maybe it was the egg or the lard or something making it that slippery and kind of slimy. But I'm now thinking it's the flour in this. I don't think it's unpleasant. It's not bad, but it's it's nowhere near a tea roll. I don't you can't even use your imagination and pretend it's a tea roll. This is just some sort of gluten-free ball of something. But it's not bad, but I don't I wouldn't recommend it. I wouldn't recommend using this for anybody at home. Um, I'd say stick to regular flour for this maybe or find a different recipe um, or show us in Facebook. Ooh, you know what? You know what that tastes like? I don't remember us using baking soda. That tastes like a pretzel a little bit. The crust on the outside, the softness of the inside, it almost reminds me of a hard pretzel. Not hard pretzel, a soft pretzel. 100%, that reminds me of a soft pretzel. It even tastes a little bit like it, which makes zero sense because there's no baking soda in it that I'm remembering. I don't know, mystery. Mmm, <laughs> the turnips are great. If you like turnips, of course you can't go wrong with this recipe. It's delicious, I like them sliced. We Again, we could have mashed them up, but I think they are a little bit better sliced like this. I think this is great. Something I think I forgot to mention is the pickles. I did plan on making the pickles this time. However, when I looked at the recipe, it's a recipe for sweet pickles, not dill pickles, and I, hate sweet pickles. I don't know a single person that likes them. And so I knew that if I made the sweet pickles that everything would have just gone to waste. I wouldn't have even been able to give them away to anybody. Weighing the cost of skipping them in this menu versus wasting food and throwing it away, I personally felt that it was a better choice to just leave it off the menu this time. And I guess I'm also considering, as you guys have been discussing with me a little bit in altering these menus, if I want to somewhat, that the women in these days picked and chose kind of what they wanted off these menus and also adjusted things for their taste. And so while I will try to keep things as close as possible to the original intention, sometimes I'm going to skip things. Sometimes I might change things. If there's something that I know I dislike and there is nobody that I know in my immediate vicinity that I could even give it away to. All right, now this isn't particularly hugely jiggly, maybe a little bit, but it's pretty full of fruit in here. Let's think I'm gonna go, let's go here. I don't know if you can see what that looks like inside, but all right, we have our salad here, our salad course, and it's supposed to be served with whipped cream. I am, I don't know if you can see this, if it's in frame or not, but I whipped up some whipped cream and a little, I have a little ninja milk frother, but there's the whipped cream and the salad. Let's give this one a try. Definitely smells strong. It smells strong like strawberry jello and I can smell the walnuts as well. This one is not bad. Now there is a, a particular difference in this jello salad compared to several of the other gelatin salads that we've had in that there's no mayonnaise in sight in here and you know what this one works this one is pretty good for me i think if you get away from the idea that jello salads are 
kind of a weird throwback. I just, I, whenever I hear about jello salads, I just think of, well, I always think of Christmas vacation um, and cat food being stuck inside of it, but also just weird combinations. And I think most people make fun of jello salads and there's not much positive uh, discussion around them and really this isn't bad at all it's kind of good I like the differences in the textures I like how the gelatin holds it all together and adds a little bit of a different flavor to it there's a nice crunch with the walnuts in there there's a lot of fun different textures with the fruit you bite into an orange or a piece of pineapple and it's a little more juicy. You bite into the banana and it's a little more creamy. I don't know, I don't, I think there's a reason that they have a bad reputation, but just like all stereotypes of everything, not all of them are bad and probably most of them are good. There's just some really, really strange, awful ones that give these jello salads a bad name, but yeah, I would say this, this actually is pretty decent. This isn't the most beautiful looking pie crust I've ever seen, but I think for all the challenges we're facing, it's not the worst. But let's find out the texture and flavor before we make any more judgments. I cut a second piece after the first one and put the first one back because it was pretty ugly and messy. This one is, it's okay. It's definitely homemade, <laughs> we'll say that. Um, it's very crumbly, the crust, while also being, like it, it wants to hold together and stay together, but it's also pretty crumbly. And I don't know if there is, maybe for this flour that was too much shortening, maybe we needed to double the flour, but what we're gonna get there. We're gonna get to know pie crusts and gluten-free pie crusts better. I'll perfect the regular pie crusts and feed them to my friends that can eat them. And I will perfect this as well, but let's taste it. Let's see uh, how it translates when we eat it. You know, the crust smells like any other crust. I don't know if you can hear the wind but it is absolutely howling out there. Anyhow, the crust smells like any other crust that I've ever made before or had before. I can smell the cherries, but definitely smell the crust more than the cherries. The filling is very good. These cherries that I used were delicious. I got them from Aldi and there's a ton of sugar in there, so that's great. The texture is wonderful. The, the middle is great. The crust doesn't taste bad, but I think maybe I needed a little more filling compared to the crust, and maybe that's because the filling that I used would have been for a 1920s pie and would, as we've discussed before, this pie pan is I don't know, probably from like the 80s or 90s, it's much bigger than a 1920s pie pan would have been. So, and the crust recipe that we used was from, uh, Cindy, you sent it to me from the Betty Crocker cookbook. And I, I don't know what year that would have been, but maybe that was for a larger serving size as well. So maybe for this it would have been less pie crust and maybe the filling would have been a little deeper in a smaller pie pan. I'm not sure, but the, the crust isn't, it doesn't taste bad, but it doesn't taste great. I think I taste a lot more shortening than I do anything else. It, it just kind of tastes and feels a little heavy. And so we're just gonna have to keep experimenting. Uh, but you know, for the first time and all of the challenges that just got thrown at us here, I'm gonna say this, this wasn't 
too bad. We're almost 25 meals in and I feel like I went from maybe having the confidence of my skills improving to today we started in on meal three and it's almost like starting over new and learning from the beginning again with these types of foods and that's kind of a a really interesting contrast where I feel like my skills are leveling up a little bit. I'm still, of course, gonna make mistakes, but definitely leveling up, confidence is leveling up with this type of cooking. And then all of a sudden, bam, let's throw an obstacle in there. And you know what, that's life. That is life all the time. And this is no different. This is mimicking life pretty well. I'm taking the mindset that instead of this being a negative obstacle, it's giving me the opportunity to reach out to some other people for maybe some help in trying some of these foods and maybe I'll bond more with them and get to know them better. Maybe we'll learn things about each other that we didn't know before and it'll give us an excuse to see each other more often. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's all I have to say about that. Okay, I changed my mind. I figured out what the cherry pie reminds me of. I took another bite of it and it it tastes saltier than regular pie crusts. And as I kind of moved into the rest of the piece and was looking at it, watching the texture of that pie crust kind of crumble and change a little bit, this reminds me more of a cherry crumble than a cherry pie. And I think if I frame my mindset around a cherry crumble, instead of it being a cherry pie, well, this is great. This turned out wonderful as a cherry crumble. So let's pretend it was cherry crumble and not a cherry pie. That's what I think I would tell my guests that it's a cherry crumble. Maybe I would cut it in little squares or something. We gotta, we have to work with the positives of what we have here and that's what we have and that's what we're going with. In general, overall, this meal I thought wasn't too bad. Even imagining what it would have been like if we would have had regular biscuits, rolls, pie crust. The foods really went together. I think they were mostly pretty warm, comforting, middle of winter foods. And I think they really, I think they went very well for the season that they are in. There was a little bit that I found lacking though, which rolls into the nutrition portion. I wasn't impressed with the lack of vegetables and I know if we would have had the cucumber pickles that we would have had you know kind of a vegetable there and we had the turnips but I think it really could have used a little bit more in the vegetable section. Our salad was again a fruit salad but struck me more as a dessert than fruit and or more of a dessert than salad I guess. It was very high in simple carbohydrates, a very starchy meal. There was protein at the beginning there with the chicken, but overall, I think great for, I guess, keeping some meat on your bones in the winter time. And if people were out doing a lot of outside work, I'm not sure what outside work other than plowing they would be doing in the winter, but I, I am very lacking on information in that. So maybe they needed a little bit of extra carbohydrates to get them through all of the snow and whatnot. I know just, just walking to the duck pen and feeding the ducks today and coming back in all of that sleet cold, it, it was, I was working way harder doing it today than I am on a clear day. So, okay, you know, I wanna give them that. I think it really could have used a little bit more in the fruit and vegetable section, and maybe we could have pulled back a little bit on some of the starches. Cost-wise, this meal should not have been too expensive. So the chicken that I got, I got a whole chicken. It was $10. The, there was a few fruits, potatoes. The cherries would have been, uh, I'm not sure how much they would have been back then. The cherries were probably the most expensive part of this meal if the flour was all-purpose flour. Now, the flour that I bought, 
I am extremely lucky that I live near a lot of discount stores, some bent and dent type stores. I live near a sharp shopper, and if you don't know what that is, go ahead, look it up. It's a great discount store. But one of the bent and dent stores that I went to, I think they do several, or I think they do a lot of Amazon returns. So they get really cool foods that are not typical for this area that I live in. They had several different types of gluten-free flour. And I believe I showed those to you, the packages to you earlier maybe. I went and looked them up, how much I would have paid for them. And I think one of them was 22 or $23 and the other one was $13. And I used all of both bags for this meal. So if, <laughs> if I would have paid full price for that, If you liked what you saw this week and would like to continue seeing more, please consider subscribing. It looks like after reviewing my analytics last week, it looks like about half of you that watch regularly are not subscribed. And if you don't want to, that's perfectly fine. But if it's something that just hadn't crossed your mind yet and you think, okay, how can I help continue this project or have this project reach more people, the more people that subscribe to this channel, the more YouTube wants to put it out there to more people. And I think the more people that we can reach, the better. And if you want to see what happens next week, tune in Friday starting at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And we're going to take on making Bavarian cream. See you then.